Legacy of a Mad Scientist by John Carrick Prologue Blue Goo August 29th, 2273 35 years ago The first day of sophomore year and half the class stood huddled around Wendell Meyer seated on an industrial table in the science laboratory. His pants were pushed up to his thigh, his ruined knee exposed for all. Wendell helped himself to a handful of the blue goo from the ten-gallon tub next to his leg. He applied it to the mangled joint. Near the beginning of the previous year, almost a year to the day, he'd been trapped in the pool's hydraulic cover. A mechanical joint had mutilated his knee. Wendell had spent the bulk of the school year in bed, taking all his classes in virtual. He'd had four surgeries, and the last set of pins had just come out last week. The doctors talked about replacing the joint altogether, but Wendell's mother had objected. Wendell Meyer and Andrew Fox had become close friends that year. After the accident, Andrew dedicated all his spare time and a significant amount of his family fortune in creating and developing the goo. It itches, Wendell said, as his skin devoured the blue-tinted mixture. Ouch! The knee swelled under the blue coating. Ah! Wendell cried. He lay back on the table, face knotted into a scream he didn't dare utter at full volume for fear of bringing a teacher. The boys watched as the knee repaired itself. A thick sweat popped out on Wendell's face. The joint began to make strange cracking and rending sounds. Wendell gulped air in tortured gasps. A few seconds later, the knee began to shrink, the blue tint staining the skin and bubbling from his pores. Within two minutes, Wendell's knee was back to its natural size, albeit a bit skinnier than the other, coated in a thick blue wrapping. The goo had become a kind of splint, a rubber bandage, holding the bones, tendons, and ligaments in place. Wendell swung his leg. It works! He gestured for Jim Croswell to pass over his crutches. Jim reached out and picked them up, but didn't hand them over. Fine, Wendell smiled and hopped down from the table. He stood on his own two feet for the first time since the accident. Smiling, he lifted and flexed the shattered knee. He walked a few steps, staring at the blue-wrapped knee, and burst running from the room, screaming wildly. Jim carried the crutches to the corner of the room and leaned them up against the wall. Who else wants to try? Andrew asked. At first, the kids were skeptical. Andrew opened a drawer full of dissection tools. Step right up, he said, and removed a tray of scalpels from the drawer. It can heal anything? Stephen asked. It's healed everything I've tried so far, Andrew answered. Ha! What have you tried? Joe Stanwood asked. Andrew smiled. He rolled up the left sleeve of his school button-down. His arm was covered with telltale blue rubber bandages. Most of the kids looked nervous, staying well away from the surgical blades. I'll go first then, Andrew said, reaching out for a knife. He brought it down across the back of his left arm, opening a long gash between his wrist and elbow, spilling blood onto the countertop. Andrew clenched his teeth and applied a smooth coating of the blue goo. He held out his arm for the others to watch. Almost as if it were reversing the damage done by the blade, the goo sealed the gash. As it worked itself out of the cut, it formed a new blue coating, and a few seconds later, Andrew's arm was as good as new. Wendell returned to the lab at full speed, catching himself in the doorframe. Thanks, Andrew. You're the best. They said I was never going to walk again. Wendell ran off again, as fast as he could his footsteps and jubilant cries trailing down the hallway. Andrew smiled, thrilled with Wendell's recovery. How does it work? Croswell asked. Supercharged polysynthetic nano stem cells. Once exposed to living tissue, it works backwards to regenerate any damaged or missing cells. Seems to work pretty good so far, Andrew said. Andrew Fox and Jim Croswell had been friends since early childhood. Their fathers often worked together on various government projects. Andrew and Jimmy saw a lot of each other growing up. They'd always been great friends. Both Croswell and Fox were considered to be at the top of their class, among their peers, and neither of them took any crap from Stanwood, who bullied everyone else. Croswell was far more athletic than Fox, so the mantle of leadership fell to him. What else did you try? Stanwood asked, nodding to Fox's arm. Joe Stanwood, 
in his own weird way, had never fit in with anyone. Most of the boys were scared shitless of him. Andy and Jim seemed able to tolerate him. It seemed to the other kids that perhaps Fox and Croswell were unaware of how spectacularly creepy Joe actually was. It was in his mannerisms, the slow way he talked and used his hands. He was, in a word, malevolent. Andrew removed his shirt. His body was covered with blue rubber strips and sections. There was almost no open skin for more than a few inches. Holy shit, Croswell said. I feel 100% fine. It activates the RNA to work overtime, fixing whatever's out of whack. Stanwood looked into Andrew's eyes, taunting him. You don't seem fine. Andrew began to unbuckle his pants, but several objections and declarations of trust stopped him. And it gets absorbed through the skin like that, Stanwood asked. You saw it. So is it better for cuts or broken fingers? I think either or, Andrew replied. Could it grow back a whole arm or a leg? Joe asked. I don't know, but I bet it can reattach them. No way, Stanwood answered. Brain injuries? How do you get it in there? Shit, maybe it can fix you, Joe, Croswell said. Several of the other kids laughed. Fox is going to be a billionaire. I bet it'll fix anything, Stephen volunteered. It fixed Wendell's leg, Tom Beckett said. He's happy as shit. Andrew realized he didn't have to answer Stanwood's objections. The other boys were making his arguments for him. They had witnessed the power of the goo. Joe Stanwood raised his hands, smiling. The guys grew quiet. Can you reattach someone's head? Stanwood asked. I don't know, but I'd love to try, Fox answered. The boys heard the challenge and responded with an ooh. Don't cut anyone's head off, seriously, Stanwood replied. I think maybe you could regrow a finger or something, but it would be expensive. Andrew said. I don't think I could do it with this. We need a thicker composition, and it would take longer. How much did it cost to make all this? Croswell asked. Close to 17 million, Andrew answered in a low voice. Holy shit, Beckett said. What? I said close to, Andrew countered. I think you get holy shit at 20. How close? Joe asked. If you figure in all the test batches, a little over maybe. But current medical science can already reattach limbs for a lot less, Stanwood pointed out. And we have lots of ways to accelerate the healing process, so this is kind of redundant. It's too expensive for the common people. All you did was waste a bunch of money. An hour later, after more than 70 healed scrapes, cuts, abrasions, lacerations, fractures, burns, and contusions, they had exhausted their creativity and courage. They had reached a place where the pain endured outweighed the novelty of having the tissue magically repaired. Andrew took notes while the boys played. He took a sample of blood from each volunteer, usually from whatever instrument of violence used to create the tissue damage, never allowing any blade to be used twice. He bagged the tools of destruction and logged each into his notebook, along with the damage done and how long it took the goo to repair the wound. With one boy, Jesse Parker, Total repair took an agonizing 47 seconds. But Jesse's wound had been rather severe. They had attacked his leg with an electric hedge clipper. Then they applied the goo and stopped the femoral artery from dumping Jesse's entire blood supply on the laboratory floor. The boys laughed and joked as they replaced chunks of meat from his thigh. A minute later, Jesse's leg was good as new, minus the damage to his school pants. Croswell had wanted to see how hard the other boys could punch him. He asked each of them to give it all they had. He dared them to outdo each other in a single strike. After taking a haymaker from everyone in the room, Tom got creative and broke a glass beaker over Jim's head. His face looked like hamburger. The boys stuck a straw in his mouth and coated his entire face in goo. Andrew estimated it cost almost $100,000 to wrap Jim's face, but they had plenty left. Bored, they began to discuss grievous mortal wounds. Andrew tried to dissuade them. Gabriel joked about cutting Sandoval's throat, who happened to not be present. He challenged Andrew to save him before he died. Andrew countered that he'd never liked Enrique and wouldn't be inclined to help him no matter what. That would leave Gabe on the hook for murder. Several boys laughed, and no one did anything excessively stupid. Andrew suggested it was time to lock the goo up. Croswell peeled the rubber from his eyes. I want to try something bigger. Something bigger like what? Andrew asked. 
I want you to cut my arm off, Jim said. You're fucking crazy, Stanwood replied. No, I'm not. Croswell looked over to Andrew. I want you to cut off my arm. Stay here. Andrew left the room. Half a dozen boys trailed after him. Croswell, Stanwood, and several others remained behind. Seriously, Joe, you should try it. It really works, Croswell said. Fuck that, Stanwood answered. You don't know what the side effects are. Maybe someday you wake up and who knows, the shit might kill you a month from now. Yeah, well, Fox will die first. Andrew walked to the locked glass trophy case in the grand entrance hall of the academy. He picked up a nearby chair and used it to knock the glass out. The surrounding boys watched as he reached into the case and removed the long samurai sword, the katana, from the daisho, a set of two swords. The set had been awarded to the Rivendell Kendo team from the Yagyu Sword School of Japan. Andrew's great-grandfather had competed in the tournament that had claimed the glorious victory. Now the young man had pilfered his ancestor's trophy case for an afternoon of raucous and juvenile amusement. Andrew argued the points and counterpoints in his mind. What he was doing was contributing to science. He needed volunteers, and to get them, he needed an extraordinary claim. An outrageous claim. A bit of theater. He had broken the glass in a calculated gesture. He needed to put an end to the experiment while they still had a ton of goo. He needed to get caught, so the discovery could be exposed, with a number of witnesses. On his way back to the lab, the boys joked about what they could do with such magical power. Several confirmed beatings they intended to dole out, and then supply the recipient with a bit of blue goo to heal them right up. The lists of rivals were long, and the actions to be taken against them were intricate, cunning, and cruel. Once Andrew and the others returned with the sword, the boys who'd waited behind fell silent. Andrew Fox looked Jim Croswell in the eyes. He held the sword up, prepared to take it out of the sheath. Jim stepped close to the tub and held his left arm out over it. Andrew stepped back, and the other boys cleared back a few steps, room enough for him to draw and swing the sword. Andrew gestured to Stephen and Jesse, standing opposite Croswell. Grab his arm, Fox said. The boys looked from Andrew to James, who nodded. They reached out to his hand. When I hit it, you have to take a right down into the goo, then right back up to his arm, Andrew instructed. Goo, we should call it glue, Stephen said. Shouldn't we put some on his arm, too? Jesse asked. Yeah, Beckett, Andrew pointed. Stand here next to the tub. When I slash through the arm, Stephen and Jess are going to be holding it. Wait for the sword to pass through, then put your hands in the tub. As they bring the forearm to the tub, I want you to take a handful of goo up to Jimmy's stump. Got it? Several kids laughed, but Tom nodded. Andrew drew the sword from the scabbard. I wonder if he'll scream, someone in the back said. Andrew looked James in the eye, and without waiting for a count of three or a ready set go, Fox slashed through Croswell's bicep and humerus. The sword severed the boy's arm with little more resistance than if it were slicing through smoke. Andrew held the sword low and still after the cut. James didn't scream. He didn't gasp. He didn't make a sound. Tom reached into the tub. Stephen and Jesse brought Jim's forearm and elbow down into the tub, passing Tom on his way up to Jim's open stump. As Tom applied the goo, an excited pulse of blood sprayed into the room. Jess and Stephen dunked the detached stump and reattached it to Jimmy's remaining upper arm. The room was quiet, except for the sound of blue and red drops hitting the floor. The goo caused the skin to swell and knit together where it had separated, Blood and blue syrup bubbled from the bicep. As the excess ran off, the remainder of the goo grew darker, harder, rubbery and thick. James smiled. He took a deep breath and wiggled the fingers of his left hand. Jesse and Stephen felt the arm come alive under their grasp. It grabbed and shook them. It had taken less than 30 seconds. Croswell pulled the limb away and flexed it. Excess goo and plasma burst from the seam, the scar, where the limb had been severed. James punched his palm and turned and slammed his hand through a wood-paneled cabinet, laughing. Withdrawing the fist, James saw he damaged it anew. He laughed as he lathered the splintered fingers with Dr. Fox's super blue healing goo. During that first week of sophomore year, all the boys involved in the incident with the goo found themselves assembled in a large conference room, 
seated with their parents and their parents' lawyers. Professor Cotton recited his discovery of the scene in the laboratory. The adults got the whole story, from Andrew's inspiration by Wendell's accident to Jim's courageous determination in the name of scientific progress. The patent filed in Andrew's name resulted in a massive windfall. In the final settlement, all the kids who'd participated in the Blue Goo experiment received a king's ransom. Joe Stanwood, who hadn't participated, got nothing. Bleeding Metal February 23, 2285 Dr. Fox set the black metal device on the desk. He'd felt its need. The machine was hungry and would have to be fed. He looked around the facility and let the dull emptiness fill his ears. The bay was abandoned at this hour. Decoratively spared to the point of empty, clusters of terminals stood separated by sheets of particle board. Couches leaned against cold metal walls. Fox knew getting caught with a second unauthorized invention would be his last mistake. Nothing would save him from another charge of treason. He looked out the window, procrastinating. Even in this he was frustrated, seeing only his reflection staring back from outside the glass. The conference center hovered at 10,000 feet, over international waters, where certain legislative restrictions could not reasonably be enforced. Here, the right to privacy was sacred. After all, that was the whole point of a secret weapons conference, out in the middle of nowhere. Dr. Andrew Fox was tall and lean, his physique that of an obsessive scientist, who ate when he had to, and rather resented the activity. The device was not as forgiving about its needs, and flashed another reminder across his mind. He scanned the area, again listening intently, taking every precaution before so blatantly exposing himself. Thank God the facility was used for dubious projects. During the past week, he'd searched, but found no surveillance equipment. If there were no cameras, he was safe. Fox triggered the feed tray and watched it extend from the small rectangular amplifier, its matte finish absorbing light. He opened the center drawer of his assigned desk and fished out some change and a letter opener. He set the coins and blunt knife next to the feed tray and closed his eyes. In his mind's eye, Fox called forth the utility menu. He could operate the device with his eyes open, but it was easier to focus on the visual cues without the added distraction of sight. He enabled the ingestion program and checked the thing's vitals. Everything looked normal. The cash was low. Available reserves in the mid-range. Fox opened his eyes. He knew the device could smell the metal and was aware it was about to be fed. He picked up a couple of coins and set them on the center of the plate. It was best to let it start slow. A moment later, they began to sink, as if the face of the plate had turned to gel. Fox closed his eyes and checked the activity display. The burn gauge spiked, and other ingestion protocols buzzed with the activity of consumption as the coins were broken down and processed at the molecular level. He felt dirty, as if he were somehow intruding, and turned the display off. He piled the remaining coins on the plate and set the letter opener across the top. The previous coins were still being metabolized, and it would take some time to consume them all. Despite the current illegality of his creation, Fox knew that eventually someone else would hit upon the idea of wireless forebrain data transfer. The signal operated wirelessly, saturating an area and forming its messages directly in the visual cortex of the frontal lobes. Eventually, someone would develop a similar concept. They could go through all the proper channels, get the proper permits, and bribe the proper committees. Then he could release his version, maybe a year or so later. He'd be accused of copying, but that was better than treason. Then he'd be in the clear. The algorithm he'd used to write the code was similar to modern telecommunications, but Fox had created a six-sided switch structure supporting the human mind. The drive seemed to have limitless space. All of his research resided in the banks of the device. He generated and received correspondence over its frequencies. He was even capable of perusing other systems without leaving a hint of his presence. In meetings, Fox would occasionally look at the ceiling or rub his forehead as if engrossed in thought. Nine times out of ten, he was accessing the device for an answer to some problem, asserting itself in his otherwise mundane environment. Dr. Fox always had the answer. The knowledge at his disposal made him an intellectual giant. Knowledge is power. 
Fox understood the government's desire to be aware of all technological advances. The potential damage inflicted by an enemy equipped with such a device could be devastating. Yet the copyright laws clearly stated that any inventions created while on the national payroll were government property. The government employed Fox across an array of fields, and even so, he might have a case if he took it to court. That is, if he made it to court. The feds didn't play around when it came to ownership rights. Everyone knew a colleague who'd been royally screwed by the Federal Acquisitions Department, also known as the heavy-handed fad. Fox watched the consumption of the coins. He could still see their faces. The wet metal had only half swallowed them. After all this time, Fox still hadn't decided on a proper name for it. For marketing purposes, it could be referred to as the mind-computer interface, as that was what it did. And lately he'd been calling it the Micronics, for short. The machine's genesis felt more like discovery than invention, as if it had been there all along, guiding him, one step at a time. After the latest upgrade to the neural interface, he now had trouble defining where the box left off, and his own mind began. Perhaps the device had named itself and filled him in. It was difficult to determine which thoughts were his and which weren't. Micronics was still his silent suggestion to the marketing team he hadn't yet hired to promote an item he decisively kept to himself. His girlfriend didn't know about it. He hadn't told her. That would be making her an accomplice. Anyone could charge you with treason, and rarely were such charges settled with a good old-fashioned fistfight. A gifted prosecutor could spin jaywalking into a crime of sedition and subversion. The arguments have become so ingrained in the minds of the citizenry it's become a unique art form, with auteurs, amateurs, and part-time dabblers. Suspicion of treachery stripped a citizen of all rights, rank, and property, pending a verdict. To be found guilty meant the death penalty. Anything less was considered mercy. Dr. Fox knew his failure to disclose the creation made him guilty of treason. He also knew how disastrous the device could be. If anyone were hurt with it, that would be his responsibility. When Oppenheimer created the bomb, the honorable thing to do would have been to torch Los Alamos before allowing two cities of innocence to burn instead. Fox would die before surrendering the device. He stared at it, flat and wide now. It would slowly return to its earlier shape, a narrow rectangle, once the meal was completed. The Micronics consumed objects to increase its processing capacity, packing the electrons into its dense liquid core. Fox didn't believe the device could think, but if it could, he might not know it. There wasn't any way for the doctor to pinpoint the origin of his thoughts, any more than the origin of those that weren't his. The concept disturbed him. When utilizing his own memory, he could easily recall much information. But after assimilating the data, he often found himself working in the Micronics environment. He couldn't remember the last time he'd pressed the power button, the device's only button. How long had it been since he'd powered it up manually? How long since he'd cycled the power at all? The machine never powered down. It was always there, at the edge of his consciousness, whenever he wanted it. If he were showering or engaged in some other activity that activated his tactile environment, it could be more difficult to interface. Occasionally, if he were physically too far away, response times would lag. But those were minor glitches. He'd polish the interface so as to be as supportive as possible to his own mind. He didn't see how he could improve it. Dr. Fox realized he was again considering a grand unveiling. He weighed the pros and cons. It would replace an entire technological sector overnight. No one would need the conventional methods of communication. Then Fox remembered he still hadn't figured out how to secure anything. Since he was the only user, he hadn't focused on signal separation. Before it could work for the public, it needed testing. Fox closed his eyes, leaned back in the chair, and reaffirmed his belief that it could never be made public. It was too much power for the common man. He wondered if it was too much power even for himself. Could he do without it? Could he endure the blank faces as he scrambled for some forgotten fact or figure? What would happen if he didn't feed it for a while and left it somewhere out of conscious range? Perhaps he would return to find that it remained fully charged. 
He doubted it would do much, left alone. When the device ran low on power, it became heavier. The menus became more difficult to access, blurry, often causing pain, a headache. If it was going to be used, it had to be fed. That much was clear. Still, Fox wondered, what would happen if he left it somewhere, out in the middle of nowhere? Somewhere he could be rid of it once and for all. Somewhere like a weapons lab, way out over the ocean. The doctor couldn't do that, wouldn't do that. He'd put so much effort into the thing's creation, its birth. Fox shook his head. Birth? A birth isn't invented. Why did that word assert itself? He took a breath and calmed himself. Thoughts of revolting against the device were reassuring. If it could influence him, it wouldn't allow him to entertain thoughts of open rebellion. It meant Fox was still in control. But he wondered why abandoning it felt like murder. Fox loved it. He had created it. While he yearned to someday have a family of his own, at present all he had was the device. He would live with his sin for one more day. Maybe tomorrow he would do something different. He leaned back in the chair and rubbed his eyes. He could still get some sleep before dawn. He crossed to the couch in an upright crawl. The soft leather was cool against his face. He would have to shave before the long day of meetings. Fox smiled as a concept arose in his mind. Could he devise an algorithm that would allow the system to spread its processing power to other objects instead of consuming them? It might be able to write to other items, which would then work for it, nodes in its network, slaves to a master. The Micronics could create base stations for incoming data streams instead of internalizing everything. He was sure it could be done. He worked out the equations and committed them to memory, testing himself, intending to measure his recollection in the clear light of morning. A solution to a long-standing problem within reach, relief washed through him. His muscles unknotted, and he drifted off to sleep. Twenty minutes later, Fox woke, suddenly startled. He looked across the room. The desk stood in place, and black. The chair stood away from the desk, afraid to be near it. Fox rubbed his eyes and looked again. The light green desk was now matte black. He noticed the walls and ceiling. What used to be gunmetal blue had taken on a distinctly darker tone. Dr. Fox remembered the equations he'd thought of earlier. He closed his eyes and focused. Sure enough, the equations had been read and recorded. The machine filed them under Upload Process Equations. Fox pulled up the history, dated just after the thought. He saw a new process, Upload Transfer. He terminated the process. It was possible the upload to the facility walls could be diffused enough to go unnoticed, or at least not be blamed on him. The desk was another issue altogether. Fox opened the patio doors. When a toilet in the nearby restroom flushed, Fox knew it was already too late. He heard the sound of someone at the sink. Dr. Fox looked at the device, the coins and knife being consumed by the plate. The consumption had stalled as the Micronics occupied itself with transferring data into the desk. The ends of the letter opener were stuck out through the sidewalls of the machine, its center being liquefied into nutrients for the kernel. Fox pulled open the desk drawer. It was metal. They were all metal. Fox couldn't put the device in there with an open feed plate. The machine would try to eat the desk, and he didn't want to imagine the results. That would involve discovery on a grand scale. The inky color of the desk was dangerous enough. Dr. Fox activated a 30-foot signal jam. The Micronics confirmed the commands as Chuck Davis, one of the acquisitions guys, entered the terminal bay. Fox smelled the scotch and cigars. Davis had been with the generals. Chuck was one of those guys who behaved as if he were 20, well into his 40s. It worked for him. Fox didn't understand men who made a living by bartering partnerships. Davis measured success by return on investment, not tangible benefit or contribution to all mankind. Fox felt sorry for him. Davis could never understand the scientists he worked with. Since Fox had known him, He'd never taken a stand on an issue. Though he displayed a dangerous talent for parroting data, 
and a nose for loose investment capital. Fox, what's the deal? You're here late. Rest when I'm frozen, Fox replied. I'll never get that one. Long-term suspension? Fool's gold. What would we do with it if we had it? Deep space exploration, maybe? No profit margin. Fox rolled his eyes and shook his head. What's that? Davis asked, gesturing to the device at the center of Fox's desk. Fox hesitated. He'd hoped he would miss it. Is that an undisclosed? Davis asked. No. You don't have any new projects on file with DOD? How would you know? Fox replied. People are watching you, and I know that is not on file. Davis was drunk, and the alcohol was catching up with him. That's undisclosed. I fucking know it is. Davis tapped the side of his head. The tapping of his head with his left hand. It would be the left eye that was wired. Probably a straight model, connected to the forebrain. He undoubtedly had a subdermal personal data recorder. Probably a series of implants under an arm or along his hip. Now Fox had to do something about the situation. If Davis had kept his mouth shut, Fox could have denied it. The images from the retinal implant could have been scrubbed, and it would be one man's word against another's. However, the audio feed would be hardwired to the storage, and now that would have to be erased as well. What do you want to do about it? Fox asked. You negotiate, right? Davis picked up a wastebasket and vomited. Fox reached for a writing tablet and set the device on it, putting them in the center drawer where it could continue its digestion in private. Fox hoped the device wouldn't slip off the tablet, It had a habit of doing that when there was metal nearby. It didn't have to have the feed tray out to eat, and often moved itself to reach whatever goodies might be close at hand. There was lots of change in that drawer. Given enough time, it would slide from the tablet to get at it. Fox hadn't given himself time to theorize about how the new upload equations would affect the device's appetite. Would it curb it, or kick it into overdrive? It was possible the signal generation required massive amounts of energy, Perhaps the device would need to consume more instead of less. If the Micronics slipped off the tablet, he would attempt to eat the desk. That was how it had gotten his handgun. Fox put a friendly arm over Davis' shoulders and led him toward the open balcony door. Let's get you some fresh air, huh? Using the Micronics, Fox hacked the optical signal and accessed the executive's storage. Immediately, Davis' security registered the intrusion and tried to shut Fox out. The doctor struggled with the daemons, but they had been upgraded. Fox recognized them. He didn't have the data wedges to crack their breakpoints. In an instant, it was over. He was beaten. There was nothing he could do about the audio without burning Davis' entire system. Davis leaned over the railing, vomiting again. Fox could burn the storage, knowing it might kill the drunken schmuck, or at least fry his mind. He could purge the data stores, leaving the security daemons intact. Their logs would show an intrusion, but there would be no evidence of what precipitated the hack. It would have to be sorted in court. Davis gave a forceful hurl, and consumed by a fit of disgust, Fox seized the man by the knees and lifted him up over the railing. He executed a coordinated attack on Davis's system, burning everything, scorching his mind as he watched the man vanish into the darkness below. Fox crossed back to the desk and opened the drawer, The feed plate was no longer digesting the coins. He lifted the interface, and they slid from the plate, the one-sided coins and bits of letter opener clattering into the drawer. Fox closed the plate and pocketed the device. He pushed the desk across the concrete floor and out onto the metal patio. Almost immediately, the patio became stained with black splotches where the desk touched it. Fox tipped it onto its side, against the railing, and the inky color ran all across the bars. He heaved the desk up over the railing, and it tumbled to a speck in his vision. He looked at the stained railing and floor. He felt as if he were standing in a puddle of blood. Fox stepped out of the stain and over to the clean side of the patio. He reached into his pocket and pulled out the device. He called up the data storage interface and deleted the upload equations. For a moment, he considered throwing it into the ocean, but then pocketed it again. Fox leaned on the railing inhaling the fresh ocean air. He stood for a few minutes, just breathing. 
When he came back to himself, it took a coordinated effort to pry his fingers from the bars. He didn't remember grabbing it, but it seemed as though he'd been locked onto it for hours. His hands were exhausted. Fox returned inside, closing the patio doors. On the railing, where he'd placed his hands, two inky stains spread into the metal, reflecting the pale moonlight. Chapter 1. Rivendell Academy. Angel City, California. 23 years later. Ashley's Journal, Monday, June 22, 2308. I don't belong here, on a bus going to summer school, but here I am, with my little brother, 7 o'clock and it's already hot. You know who goes to summer school? Bullies and nerds. That's right, the stupid kids and the smart kids. This is where they meet and establish the relationships in which one group will persecute the other for the entire year. Summer session is half advanced placement, half remedial classes, mixed with a little art, music, and sports. Lions and antelope. It's a slaughter every year. And the adults just want to mold us into tools. They do what they ask, but they can see it's too easy. They're not even bothering to hold the hoops out anymore. I've asked my dad about moving me ahead a couple grades, even just to take the test, to see if I'm ready, but he says it's still too early. So it's another day in the prison without bars that is my life, more like zoo. Most parents in this tax bracket send their kids away to camp or to visit relatives on hereditary European estates. And we have to go to camp too, but not fun camp. We have to go to because it's good for you camp. The fact that I have no input has become something of a hostile drama at home. I want to go to ballet camp. I've wanted to go since I was five. I get up an hour early to stretch. I do three hours of free practice every day before class. But no, for the third summer in a row, I have to go to kung fu camp. Three weeks with a bunch of clumsy, uncoordinated boys. If they wanted to be good at kung fu, they should take ballet. We work so much harder. They have no idea. Tonight we're supposed to talk about it, but what's the point, really? I'll talk and he'll say whatever he's going to say and then ignore me, like he always does. Then he'll give Jeffrey whatever he wants, and that will be the end of it. I don't get why he's being such a dick. He doesn't care what I do the rest of the year. Why do these three weeks have to be caveman training? I'm not a boy. Get over it already. On one of the outlying anti-gravity sections, several thousand feet above the earth, the heavily wooded Rivendell campus was far from abandoned. Ashley and Jeff stepped off the bus, with a few other students, into the early morning haze. The air was muggy and still, warming as the obscured sun cooked off the cloud cover. Walking away from the shuttle, Ash and Jeff noticed Ted across the playground. A few of the older boys had surrounded him. They pushed him and tried to wrestle away his book bag. Derek was the most intimidating, but he could be nice if you got him alone. The same could be said of Pete. Steve, however, was the most vicious of the group. Ashley suspected he was responsible for most of the trouble they got into. Ashley looked at the few nearby adults who ignored the incident. Jeff watched her closely, as he always did. Ashley caught Jeff looking at her with puppy dog eyes. What do you want me to do? she asked. Stop them, Jeff replied. Jeff, come on, are you serious? You know no one else is gonna. Steve slapped Ted hard enough to make him whimper. They don't care at all, Jeff gestured to the adults, none more than fifty feet away, a few much closer. They were all preoccupied with other children, or each other. Steve punched Ted in the stomach. They're always picking on him, Ash. Ashley sighed, handed Jeff her bag, and marched toward the snarling knot of children. Without making eye contact, Ashley pushed through the bullies and grabbed Ted by the collar, almost as if she meant him more harm than the other three. The look of fear shot across Ted's face. Ashley smiled. She spun and hurled him from the group. Ted stumbled and lost his bag, but didn't fall. A couple of adults turned his way, but he straightened up and walked across the playground without looking back. At least, not until he reached Jeff, where together they watched from a safe distance. Ashley turned to face Derek, Pete, and Steve. 
Ted's bag lay on the ground between Ash and the boys. Pete saw they had drawn the attention of at least one playground supervisor and took a step back. Derek stood his ground, but said nothing. Steve smiled and stepped forward. What do you want, Fox? I want Ted's backpack, Ashley said, gesturing to the pack lying between them. You do, huh? Well, it ain't yours, is it? Steve said. It's not yours either. Well, Ted, see, him and I, he and I, Ashley interrupted. What's that? Steve asked. It's not him and I. It's he and I, or him and me, but never him and I. That's why you're in summer school, you dumbass. Is that so? Steve towered over the bag. Even though he and Ashley were the same height, he seemed so much taller than her. Like I said, I was talking to Ted a minute ago, but you interrupted him and me from our little conversation. I saw how you were talking to him, Ash said. The moment seemed to shift down into slow motion. Steve was the most ruthless bully in Ashley's class. Some of the adults had turned their heads and were now watching, but no one was close enough to stop him from hitting her, if he wanted to. And now she was in the process of antagonizing him. She could not stop herself. Her mouth was already moving, her lungs giving life to her thoughts. Ashley watched, from some frozen place inside her mind, calm, cool, and relaxed, fully aware of what she was willfully doing. Are you going to say the same kind of things to me? You should really think it through. Picking on Ted is one thing, but now you're going to hit a girl? She smiled her most sarcastic, condescending smile. The moment stretched on, just hanging. She waited for Steve to strike her. She was daring him, taunting him. Did he have the guts to hit a girl, with half a dozen adults in view? He did. Ashley saw his body tense. She saw his hand fly toward her face. She instinctively shifted her posture, leaning back and to her right. His hand sailed past, missing her by half an inch. Steve's balance was off, and he stumbled, first to the side and then backward, as if afraid Ashley might take a swing at him. Ashley noticed the teachers were turning away again. Suddenly, she understood the situation. Unless Steve seriously hurt Ted, it would be difficult for the teachers to sufficiently punish him. In order to suspend him, or expel him preferably, he'd have to genuinely hurt someone. Ashley had no intention of being that someone. Steve narrowed his eyes. Ted's bag lay directly between them, only a step away for either of them. Ashley knew that if she went for it, Steve would jump her, so she waited. She shifted her weight and took half a step backward, as if she were giving up. Steve boldly stepped up and reached for the backpack. Just a fraction of a second later, Ashley stepped forward, reaching for the bag, knocking into Steve with her forehead. From a distance, it looked as if it were an accident, but Steve caught the wicked grin that flashed across her face. He crumpled to the ground, blood gushing from his smashed nose, painting his baby blue school shirt a glossy crimson. The sun broke through the haze, illuminating his humiliation in sharp, sarcastic hues. Ash picked up the bag. To his credit, Steve didn't cry. He sat on the curb, pinched the top of his nose and waited for the pain to subside. He didn't acknowledge her in any way. Ashley realized he'd probably dealt with this type of injury before. She turned and walked away, saying nothing. Every kid and every adult on the playground had their eyes glued to her. Ashley acknowledged none of them. She looked only at Ted and Jeff. They watched as she handed Ted his backpack. Ashley put her arm around her brother, and the three of them walked into school. Ash acknowledged the layered irony in that moments before, she had been angry about the violent techniques she would spend the next few weeks studying. Yet here she had used violence, and if she were honest with herself, she had enjoyed it. Chapter 2 Jenny Erling Later that afternoon, Ashley entered the dance studio, and a few snickering girls went quiet. Ash acknowledged the obvious awkwardness but didn't comment on it. Rebecca stepped forward from their center and sneered at Ashley. Hey, Ground Pounder, heard you beat up Steve Shepard this morning. Must be tough being a dirt dweller if you can even beat up sky-class boys. 
The girls surrounding Becca laughed openly. It was an accident, Ashley answered. And if it wasn't, do you think teasing me is a good idea? Rebecca, or Becca, had always been second in their class. None of the girls compared to Ash. She eclipsed them so entirely it made her something of an outcast. Because of the open hostility between the girls, Ashley didn't take her free practice in the studio, but rather in the abandoned theater. She had enjoyed the last three hours stretching and practicing in silence, while Becca and the others had occupied the cramped studio. Ash walked past her, but Becca wasn't finished. We just want to know your secret. Do you get a lot of practice at home, dancing around all the bugs? Ashley's piercing blue eyes glared at Becca. Are you saying there are bugs in my house? Well, I wouldn't know. I've never set foot on that filthy dirt ball. Becca shared a malicious smile with her friends. The gaggle confronting Ashley all lived in the hovering districts of Angel City, while her family lived on the ground. It wasn't that her parents were poor. In fact, her family was wealthier than most of her friends combined. But Ashley had no way of knowing that. Her father claimed that he preferred living close to the earth. He wanted his children to know the beauty of living under real trees. Over and over again, he had explained that city people always felt uncomfortable in the forest. It was vital to him that his children feel comfortable in nature. Ash stood before the laughing girls. She paused for a moment and tempered her rage before replying, Becca, if you're pissed at me because I'm a little better than you, you're going to be mad at people all your life. Rebecca flushed with anger. Several girls caught their breath, and a couple said, Ouch, or Ooh. The room fell quiet as their instructor, Mrs. Rabier, entered. She ignored the confrontation and gestured for the girls to line up at the bar and begin their stretches. The girls shuffled, stumbled, and dragged themselves across the hardwood floor, except for Ashley, who glided over to an empty spot at the rail. She couldn't help the fact that she was a better dancer than Becca and the others. She always had been. It was obvious in her walk. All the girls worked hard, but none of them compared to Ashley's grace and economy of movement. Simply put, and although she did not know it, Ashley was a better dancer because her father had created her that way. She was, like her brother Jeff, her father's legacy. Dr. Andrew Fox represented the razor's edge of genetic manipulation and cybernetic engineering. He had created Ashley to be perfect, and his creations always exceeded expectations. After class, Mrs. Raber asked Ashley to stay behind. Becca and her friends noticed, but said nothing. Ashley waited patiently. Mrs. Raber let the door close, looked Ashley in the eye, and said, You need to make a decision. Until you face it and see the world for what it is, it's going to hold you back. You don't have to answer what I'm about to say, but I'd like you to think about it. Ashley nodded. I heard what happened between you and Steve Shepard this morning. Ashley remained mute. They said you broke his nose. Is that true? The ballet teacher asked. Not the way you say it, Ashley answered. The way I say it? What do you mean by that? I mean I didn't punch him. I never said you did. Ashley didn't answer, suspecting she would soon be accused of being difficult. So what happened? You had nothing to do with it? Mrs. Raber asked. I was reaching for Ted's bag. Can't Ted pick up his own bag? Mrs. Raber was a large woman. Ashley wondered how she'd become a ballet teacher, but her advice was usually helpful. This, however, felt intrusive. I was taught to be polite and help people. I guess Steve was too, because when Ted dropped his bag, we both tried to pick it up for him. Ashley smiled her, I'm faking and I want you to know it, smile. You were picking it up at the same time. That's when we bumped heads, Ashley answered. I see. Why would they tell the story differently? I guess it would depend on who they are. Mrs. Raber was quiet for a moment. Is this what you wanted to ask me about? Ashley asked. No, it's not. Look, Ashley, Becca is not going to change. It's up to you. You are going to have to be the one who tries something different, or it is you who is going to lose out in the long run. Should I handle Becca more like Steven? Ashley smiled. Absolutely not. 
Becca doesn't want to fight. She wants a friend. She doesn't have friends. She has conspirators. They just take turns turning on each other. They're snakes, Ashley said. You know she's here three hours a day, practicing three times harder than you do? Both of you could go pro in a few years, but she'll never have half your talent. Ashley's inner glee at using the theater to warm up could not have been more rewarding if it had been made of gold. Ash did work hard. In fact, she worked her ass off. But to have the others believe it came naturally provided both a source of pride and even a bit of shame in the obvious deceit. How is this my problem? she asked. It is your problem because you're going to meet a lot more people just like her. You need to win her over. I don't mean her personally, but as a test case, just so you can learn how to do it, in case you need to someday. Mrs. Rabier paused for a long moment and then let out a sigh. Let me tell you a story. This is the hardest lesson I ever learned. When I was young, I had a teacher who had once been a student at Wellstone Dance Academy. This is on the East Coast, where I grew up. The director, Miss Marks, was a hateful old crone. Now they held an audition every year, and I was dying to get in, until I met Director Marks. Suddenly Mrs. Raber became a girl in Ashley's eyes. Some internal change had softened her features. Ash saw a real person talking, not just an adult playing a role. Ashley could see that she, Allison, had been tall and graceful. She felt as if she'd never met her before. Beneath the instructor mask, she was charming. When I went for my audition, my instructor downplayed the significance of Wellstone because of his negative experience there, but I was desperate to get accepted. When I was summoned in, now this was part of her technique, Director Marks was still criticizing the girl before me, and she was cruel. I don't know why, but I wasn't scared of her. I knew I was good, not as good as some of the girls I knew, but I'd been blessed with height, and I was pretty, and I too worked my ass off. Also, I think I wasn't scared because my teacher didn't think much of her. He was a clear-headed and disciplined man, not emotional, and yet he could still be enthusiastic. I don't know how, we were just children, but he treated us like adults, a great instructor. Anyhow, I went through my routine, I did fine, but it wasn't my best performance. I was kind of detached that morning. You know, I remember, that was the first time I considered doing something else with my life, something other than ballet. Allison smiled. Director Marks gave me an offhand compliment. I remember her hardly even watching. She'd been preoccupied with one of her assistants, but I had done well. For me, it was anticlimactic. I already had my epiphany. I wasn't attached to the outcome anymore. I ended up going to another school and didn't even pursue dance right away. I just registered for the basics my first year. The world felt so much larger all of a sudden. But that's just half the story. This is the part that is relevant to you. Another girl I knew, Jenny Erling, she did go to Wellstone. Jenny was the nicest girl I'd ever met. Everyone who met her liked her. No one ever had anything mean to say about her except that she was too nice. It took a while. But Jenny broke this evil old woman, just as you would a horse. It made the papers. This cruel lady became a compassionate person. Director Marks recreated the way we teach dance. To this very day, you are all following her program, because she published it for free. No one had ever done anything like that before. Back then, all the programs required non-disclosure agreements. What's that? Ashley asked. You had to sign a contract that said if you ever told anyone or God forbid taught anyone what you learned at the academy, you could be sued or put in jail. So when Director Marks had a change of heart and published her manifesto, it was a newsworthy event. She gave Jenny Erling 100% of the credit for changing her mind. This sort of thing may happen every day, but I've never heard of it before. If it hadn't happened in ballet, in my immediate circle, I might not have heard of it at all. But my point is this. Rebecca is small potatoes. Someday you may be up against a director, Marks, and you won't be able to beat her with clever observations. You'll have to befriend her. I knew I didn't have it in me. I gave up ballet because I knew I didn't have that in me. I didn't know it right away, but when all this hit the headlines, about two years after my interview, well, I changed my major to education because of Jen's example. 
I was more impressed with what she did than I ever was by any dancer. A perfect pirouette is nothing compared to that. What do you even call that? Anyhow, that's what sets someone apart from the crowd. That's what they mean when they say we're not all born with the same gifts. Anyone can dance. Does your friend still dance? Oh yeah, she's married now. Goes by Jennifer Kleinfer. Her shows are sold out a year in advance. I know who she is. She's famous. Well, it's not for her dancing. It's what she represents. Director Marx was famous for her harsh severity. Jenny changed that program forever. Director Marx retired a while ago, but the dancers from Wellstone are better every year. Of course, it's all back to being secret again, but the published work is still out there. Why are you telling me this? Ashley asked. It's unnatural to forgive someone small and petty, like Rebecca, but life is about lifting each other up, and both of you would be better for it. Ashley blinked. And Stephen? she asked. Don't worry about the boys. Most of them are a lost cause and the rest can take care of themselves. I want to live on an island, Ash said, looking at her feet. Do you have one? Allison asked. No. Then you have to work with people until you do. After a pause, she asked. Steve and his friends, they were beating up Ted, weren't they? Yes, Ashley answered. And if you hadn't stepped in, Ted might have ended up bleeding. Probably. That was pretty ballsy, breaking it up like that. Ash remained quiet. All's well that ends well, Allison smiled. But try to think about what I said. Becca is going to be here every day. Maybe you could practice in here, with the rest of them, instead of in the theater? Ashley looked up, frowning and frustrated to have her secret so suddenly exposed. I know it's a tough lesson, but all of life is about this one lesson. Learn it soon. You can meet a Judith Marks anywhere. Ashley's Journal, June 22, 2308. Monday afternoon. Mrs. Raber told me she knows Jennifer Kleinfer. Seemed as if she's been waiting years to tell that story. And she gave me a lecture about frenemies like Rebecca Tavington. Turn the other cheek, etc., etc. Rebecca is a brat. She's clumsy and arrogant, and I'm not helping her. And Mrs. Rabier had the chance to go to Wellstone, and she passed it up. What could I possibly learn from her? I can't believe I have a chance to go to their summer program, and my dad is not letting me. He keeps saying next summer. I broke Steve Shepard's nose this morning. He and his buddies were picking on one of Jeff's friends. Three seventh graders against a fourth grader. He got what he deserved. Maybe Kung Fu Camp won't be so bad, but I still don't want to go.